Hello and welcome to this video on uh, nouns, uh, nominals generally, ending in consonants, those consonants that I'm dealing with in this video being the palatals, that's some j and ch and sh, uh, the cerebrals, there's only one that we need to look at here, that's sh, and ending in h and r. These form part of the range of unchangeable stems, and that essentially means that the stem does not change with the exception of the final letter in it, which changes by sandhi only. That's not a grammatical change, that's purely a phonetic change. We'll be looking at uh, MacDonnell, paragraphs uh, 79 to 82. Uh, if you just quickly look at those pages, they, they, they look rather daunting. Um, tables of, it seem, random sounds and rules to learn. But I'll take you through it step by step logically. It's not nearly as daunting as it seems at first sight. There is a pattern and a logic to it, to it all. What I would urge you to do is not try to learn anything by heart at this stage, but you're welcome to do so if it suits your personal learning style, but just follow this, follow what I'll be telling you, and follow the, the pattern. Once you've seen the pattern there, everything will fall into place naturally. And although you may think the, the bad news is that Sanskrit um, has a whole lot of rules to learn, um, and that, yes, actually it does. But the, the, the good news is that in the early stages, if you stand back and see these regular patterns running through it, the whole thing will become a lot easier. And it's even more worthwhile doing it in that way if you're also a student of Pali, um, because once you've grasped the patterns and the systems in Sanskrit, I've said many times before, and this won't be the last time, it will help you so much in understanding what is going on in the, the, the rather uh, looser system of, of Pali. So we've dealt with the single, or the, I should say the unchangeable stems ending in dentals and labials. Uh, we did that in uh, video 78, 70, sorry, 77, 78. I would urge you to look at that before you go through this one, because this one is slightly more complex. But if you've got the hang of what's going on with the uh, stems ending in dentals, particularly um, at MacDonnell 77, um, the rest will simply be a variation on that theme. There's nothing really very complex to learn, even though the way it's laid out on the page in MacDonnell ma ma makes it look a bit daunting. Now, you'll see, look at the scheme of things, and if you have MacDonnell with you, great, you can call it up, of course, um, online. In all of these sections dealing with labels that we've already done, and palatals in paragraph 79, cerebrals in 80, H in 81, and ending in R in, in 82, in each case, the, the relevant noun is not declined in full you know, throughout all cases and numbers. You'll notice that in each case, only four words are given. There's a reason for that, and that is those are the only four that you need to know in order to be able to decline the whole lot. It's rather like the those of you who have Latin, um, the, the principal parts of the verb. Um, Latin has got you know, pages and pages, tables of uh, con conjugation of verbs. But in Latin, with very few exceptions for some uh, irregular verbs, once you've learnt 
how a conjugation goes, then all you need to know for any other verb of that con conjugation is four forms of that verb. And it's the, for those who know Latin, it's the amor, amare, amavi, amatum. Moneo, monere, monui, montum. And most importantly for the th third conjugation, dico, dicere, dixi, dictum. Now for dico, dicere, dixi, dictum, if you know those four variations, then you'll be able to conjugate that entire verb in all its very numerous forms correctly. It's the same principle here with these um, with these nouns in in Sanskrit. Once you know the, the these four, I'm just talking here about these um, unchangeable stems that change only for Santi. Once you know those four, you've uh, effectively got got the whole lot. Notice in particular, if you're looking at MacDonnell, which please do, that the look under nominative plural. I'll, um, I'll point, point to it on the screen there. There's nominative plural uh, for each one. You'll notice in, in each case, right throughout this series, that it is the, it ends in an ah, and it's the ah added to the stem, not altered by any sandhi. So that's the final consonant of that stem, followed by ah. The other three, if you look at, um, for instance, the Vach speech, nominative singular, it, it changes to Vach. That's not, so to speak, a grammatical change, that's purely a phonetic change. That's because Sanskrit, in Sanskrit you cannot have a word ending in a ch, that ch is going to change to its corresponding guttural, which is a k, so that's why Vach becomes Vach. Vacha, nominative plural, vacha. Vacha, nominative plural, that uh, the ch remains unchanged because, of course, you can have a ch followed by a vowel, um, which is how it, it no normally appears. So there's no, there's no reason in Santi that dictates that the ch should change to, to something else. So there it is, it remains unchanged. Vacha. Now, the next one across, the instrumental plural, um, vagbi, you notice that the, the ch has changed to a g. That's because you can't have a ch followed by a b, followed by um, another stop. That's a, a non liquid co co consonance. So it has to become the guttural, just as vach becomes vak. So vach b becomes vag b. It's simply the voiced form of the vak. Now look to the locative plural ending in su. Again, you can't have vach su. The rules of santi don't allow it. So that ch becomes a k again. And su is added directly to that. In fact, the su becomes a shu um, because under the rules of Sandhi, a k followed by a s become you can't have a x in the same word, it's a kr. Now again, look at the nominative plural column. The reason only one form is given here, nominative plural, rather than the all of the other um, cases, the genitive singular would be vacha, locative singular vachi, dative singular vache, and so on, um, because that's the only one that needs to be given, because that is, because it's the same, the unchanged stem, vach, for all endings beginning with a vowel. So only one needs to be given to show you, and all the other endings, which is the majority of them, that end in a vowel, it's it's equally the same. You know, instrumental be vacha, and so on, locative vachi. Equally, look at the instrumental plural, 
bug p. And that's going to be a, a similar story then for the date of an ablative ending in pia. It's going to be vag pia. So we'll now look at each of these groups in, in detail. Um, firstly, the stems in palatals, that's a, a ch and a j in the palatal sh. Now, the first thing to notice, as we already know, is that a Sanskrit word is not allowed to end in a ch, and if the, the root ends in a ch, as in vach, then if it's if it becomes a word on its own, a freestanding word, that ch will change to a k. So I'll share my iPad screen with you now. So again, this shows the importance of of knowing the patterns in Sanskrit and how if you master the patterns and some basic rules, so many other seemingly complex things can fall into place. A word that would otherwise end in a ch, the ch invariably becomes a k. Once you know that, then basically you know everything you need to decline fully any stem ending in a ch. Because if it's on its own, if it's just vach, nominative singular, vach has to become vak. Look there on the page, there it is, nominative singular, vak. Where the ch is followed by an ending beginning in b, which would be um, b for the instrumental, and b, that's instrumental, and um, b for the dative and ablative. That ch that same ch that becomes a k at the end of a word, that k now becomes a g, so it becomes vag bhya. Vag bhya, instrumental vag bhya, for the um, dative and ablative. And equally, for the ending in su, which is the locative plural ending, you'll see that that reflects the Eshu, Nareshu, Deveshu of the of the short a declension. This is just it ends in a straight su for the um, for the consonantal declension. So vach su which you can't have, that becomes a the ch again changes to a k vach su and again, by sandhi, because it's a k followed by a s in the same word, that su becomes a shu, so it becomes vakshu. And as I mentioned earlier, all of the endings, the declensional endings that start with a vowel, they simply get added straight on to the, the unchanged stem, Vach without without changing it. So vacha, vacha, vachi, vache, uh, and so on. Now looking down this column, pretty much the same principle applies. If a word ends in j, this this um, the word on word for um, there aren't very many words in Sanskrit where the ends in a j. Asrij is one. And the j at the end of a word, whereas the ch always changes to a k at the end of a word, the j sometimes changes to a k, and, but also um, you have it changing to a d sound. So 
um, asrij, the j changes to a k. And once it's done that, then it behaves exactly like vach. So the plural instrumental will be asrigdhi. The locative plural um, asrikshu. Nominative singular asrik. And for all of the endings um, that start with a vowel, it's just the unchanged asrij. So, for example, um, the the locative singular will be asriji. The the ablative singular will be uh, the instrumental sorry singular will be asrija. The ablative and genitive will be asrija. Note by the way that the uh, asrij is, is a neuter word, and so the the nominative plural just ends in uh, an e but with a nasal before the final consonant. So, asridge, the uh, plural, neuter plural, is asringi. So, that's the E ending for the neuter plural and with the nasal inserted. Now, for the, the next in this list, which is ruj, uh, meaning a disease, this where we have the word roga, meaning a disease. And if you are a roga, you are disease-free or health healthy. But the the root here ruj, and this behaves exactly like vach, um, in that the the j here becomes a k or a g. K if it's either at the end of the word or with an a su following. So you see. Ruk on its own, rukshu, plural, and the instrumental plural is rugbi, and of course the dative and the ablative plural be rugbia. So not every word that ends in j changes that by sandhi to ka, and most do. Sometimes it becomes a ta. We see the word samraj, that's from our familiar word, raja, king, <coughs> and uh, rajya, kingdom. So samraj becomes samrat. So stem form samraj, nominative singular, samrat. As for all of the others, the that j remains the j before all endings beginning with a vowel. So the, the plural is a samraja, nominative plural samraja. The genitive and ablative singular also end in a, so samraja, locative samraji, instrumental samraja, and so on. So just as it becomes samrat, so that d changes to a d, it has to be voiced before the endings beginning with b. So the instrumental plural of samraj goes from samraj, samrat, with the unvoiced d, but followed by the b or the b, the d changes to a d. So samrad b, samrad b. And before the final su for the locative plural, uh, the d can remain unchanged before the su, and the su doesn't change either. So the locative plural is samrat su. And for dish, which means, uh, a, given here in, in um, MacDonnell as a cardinal point, it just means a pointing from the root dish, meaning to, to, to point, uddesha, pointing out. 
Um, it's cognate actually with the, the Latin root dic, as in dicere, to say indicare, to indicate, that's pointing out. In Sanskrit is uddish, to point out, and in um, Latin indic, indicare, to point out. Uh, used in its root form here, this is one of these words, there are not very many, a few, this is one of the words, a uh, dish, where the, the, the root form is also a word on its own. But remember that as a word on its own, no Sanskrit word can end in a sh. I mean, as, when you quote it as a root, of course, we can, but it's not a pure word there, it's just a grammatical abstraction. So as a word in a sentence, you couldn't have dish, it would have to be dick, and the sh changing to a k. So as we see now, look down these columns, so dick, and then disha for the plural, as you'd expect, and digbhi, by the points, the instrumental plural, digbhi, and dikshu. And you see this is behaving now, because the sh changes to a k, you say, aha, the sh changes to a k, therefore it totally follows um, the, the, um, the pattern of vach and with um, vish, now the word vish um, a settler we know the root vish meaning to, to enter pravishati, to enter um, pavisati in Pali but vish the final sh normally becomes k by Sandhi, but occasionally becomes a t, just like the j mostly becomes a k at the end of the word by Sandhi, sometimes becomes a t. So the same with vish, vit, and so vit then behaves in exactly the same way as samraj, samraj, samrat, um, the plural, nominative plural, samraja, visha. Instrumental plural, samradbhi, vidbhi, and the locative plural, samratsu and vitsu. And you see at, towards the bottom of page 37 in MacDonnell, it just gives a few other words that are declined in the same way. In Vach, Twitch, skin, ruch, light, sruch, label, jalamuch, a cloud. Incidentally, twitch for skin, it, it becomes tacha in Pali, but twitch, skin, look at that, twitch, of course, to, as a noun on its own, it becomes twak in the nominative singular, and twak, incidentally, um, it's the twak, its original meaning was a covering, it's the skin, as the covering of the body. So Sanskrit we have uh, twak, and just as in English the word deck means a covering, it's from, from that same root. And incidentally, um, the to de, and from, from Latin, to detect, the, the Germanic form deck, and through Latin detect, it's, it's that same tect. And in, in medical terms, an integument, that teg, is that from, from, from that same, same word. An integument is like a membrane that, that covers an organ. So we needn't detain ourselves any longer on the, uh, the stems and palatals. We'll just look now at the stems and cerebrals. Uh, look now to, it's on page 38 of MacDonnell, and it's um, paragraph number 80. We see Dwish, enemy. Now, the cerebrals both change the sh to a t. So Dwish on its own would be a dwit. And that then behaves in the same way as the ones we saw in section 79. Um, 
So it's in a vish, which you can writ. So it, it behaves in the same way. Also in twit, dwisha, any as usual, any of the endings with a vowel go straight onto the um, consonant stem without the consonant stem changing. And for the instrumental plural, dvid, the dvit becomes dvidpi. So dvish to dvit, you can't have dvitbi, it becomes dvidbi. And the locative plural dvitsu. And exactly the same uh, for the for pravrish, which are meaning the rainy system. Look now at number 81, stems in H. Most stems in H, they change that H to a K. And when that happens, well, you already know what happens because then they behave in the same way as Vach. So the nominative plural would be Duha, duh meaning milking. Um, it's only ever used as a suffix, for instance, kama duh, desire milking. It's like the, it's something you milk it and it will give you give you in, in anything you want. It's one of these uh, mythical things, like the 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 magical cow. You mil milk it for in anything you want. So as usual, the duh duha remains as a h an ordinary unchanged H before the vowel endings it becomes duk in the nominative and dhugbi in the instrumental plural the g H becomes a k and that could be then becomes a g before a b and in the locative plural dukshu the su becoming shu, as we saw in vakshu, astrikshu, dikshu, and so on. Note a particular phenomenon here. The, let's look at this word du, and it's the same for the next one, which is dru, meaning mean a, um, a stem or a root, meaning injuring. Du. The phenomenon you need to look at is this where that h becomes another consonant like duk so the h becomes a k at the end of a word in santi mostly it doesn't become an aspirated h aspirated k no it doesn't do that but there is an awareness that you've lost a h huh somewhere. So what happens is you compensate for that, that if the preceding consonant is capable of taking an aspiration, which d is, it becomes a d. So d becomes dhuk. That's why you see dhuk looking at um, in the first row of examples under paragraph 81. And the same happens in the instrumental plural before the endings in a b. Dhugbi. And equally before the in the locative plural ending su, so it's not duksu, but dhukshu. So taking it now to the locative plural from du. H changes to a k, so that aspirates the preceding d, so it becomes duk. And for the instrumental plural, duk, add on the, the characteristic su of the, so let's say instrumental plural, I meant locative plural, add on the characteristic su, and of course after a k, it becomes cerebralized, so dukshu. And you'll see the same phenomenon for the next one, dru, and it applies even with a liquid vowel, that is a, a liquid consonant rather following, so duk, so dru, 
injuring. It becomes druk. I'm writing in asterisks because this is an incorrect form that does not exist. Because the H is lost, you change the consonant because it's capable of being an aspirate, so you change it to an aspirate, even though a R follows. So, druk. And the same then for the instrumental. Drug B. So the K changes to a G. And equally for the instrumental, so the, sorry, locative plural. Drukshu, that same D there. Notice now in the next one, Ushni. meaning a meter, a meter in the sense of measure. By the way, note in particular, the way I've written the H here, it's not the visarga with the dot underneath, this is, this is a full H in its own right, the full consonantal H. So the, the nominative plural is ushniha, and for example, the date of singular is ushnihe, locative singular ushnihi the full consonantal H. It changes as as the duh change to duk and druh change to druk. This final H also changes to a K. It becomes ushnik. Now where that happened both in duh and in druh the loss of the H resulted in the aspiration of the preceding consonant capable of being aspirated, to druh, to, to druh. In ushne, there is not a consonant, a preceding consonant that's capable of being aspirated. So what happens? You do nothing. The H is simply lost, replaced by a K, and there's, there's no compensatory aspiration because there's no consonant capable of taking it. And at the bottom of page 38, that's the, the, the last two example stems in H, the madhuli, um, the, the, the root li, meaning to lick. It's cognate with our English lick. It's uh, Sanskrit, oh, Vedic li. Uh, we say lick. But the this one is get the H changing to a T. So the H, the final H normally changes to a K by Santi, occasionally to a T. So, a, sorry, a cerebral T, lit. So you get lit here, madhulit, um, uh, mead liquor, honey liquor, which is the word for a B. Um, and as usual, the nominative plural, liha, that full consonantal H unchanged. And in the instrumental plural, you see madhulidbhi, the same as the the other words we've looked at, which change the the final to a t. So vidbhi, lidbhi, and litsu. And there is one word, I think it's unique in Sanskrit, I think it is, where you get a final h which changed to an ordinary um, dental t, which is the word up. Bana, meaning um, a shoe. Actually, the root na, meaning to, to knot, to tie up. I probably cognate with our English word knot, as in knot, you know, tying a knot. And the upana is something you tie on, you tie it round the uta upana, you up, up on, knot it, something you knot round your feet, upana. And that changes to, oops, sorry. Upanat. Now, just as if the t, as in lit, changes to lid p, so the t changes to a dental d, the endings in b, so it would be upanad b. 
tanah then the h huh, changes to a t and the t changes to a d before the b endings upanad the b and in the locative plural as we'd expect just upanatsu upana the then that becomes upanat upanatsu in the shoes upanatsu now finally we will look at stems that end in uh, r the words given here they're in fact quite rare in that um form dvar yet the word exists but normally even the sanskrit has dvara which is uh, declined like an ordinary uh, ending and pura normally pura rather than pur meaning a town normally gira uh, rather than gir meaning a voice but we do them here for the sake of uh, com completeness and here the just as a final s changes to visarga at the end of a word so a final r equally changes to visarga that's why you get dvar door so in the nominative singular form that it has become dvah and there it will behave like any other visarga so it was um, if it's followed by a t it would change to to an s dvas t and then whatever comes off after, after that for the forms of the noun where the ending begins with a vowel it follows the usual pattern we've seen through all the others so the plural of dvar gir and pur is dvara gira and pura In the endings with a b, the r remains in place, so there's nothing new to learn here. So the instrumental plural for all of the, for these is dwarbhi, girbhi, and purbhi. And you add the su for them all, but the su changes to a shu because if you get an r plus s in the same word, it becomes rsh. So you get dwar shu. This locative plural, yirshu and purshu. Notice here that where you have an, a noun ending in sh, with a short vowel and then r, that short vowel lengthens in the nominative singular. So gir, nominative singular, becomes gir voice. So gir. Gi, nominative singular, and the same for pur, nominative singular, is puha. Note also that this short e and short u will lengthen before the b and the sh endings as well. So it's girbi, not girbi, but girbi. And girshu and instrumental, sorry, instrumental plural purbi, not purbi, but purbi, and in the cities, in the towns, would be purshu. So that concludes this uh, video now for the set of unchangeable stems. And the last one we'll do in a separate video because uh, the ones ending in S um, have their own slightly special rules. So I'll deal with those uh, separately in, in the next one.